The base is dropped on Atlanta, Georgia. Soccer down here, December 13th, Thursday Thoughts edition of the show. I'm Jason Longshore. Jarrett Smith is with me so far. John Nelson said he would be with us. Um, he tweeted that, or he sent us a message on Twitter, what, 20 minutes ago? I think he fell asleep. I mean, I mean, maybe. like, And that's, yeah, I was like, eh. It was there was a lot of there was a lot of determination in that tweet. Yeah, yeah, it sounded good. Um, it has not come to fruition as of yet. Uh, John was John was on the call the late game last night uh, with the Georgia high school football playoffs. That would be Milton and Colquitt. Yeah, how did that turn out? I didn't even see the end of it. Oh, Milton won fourteen thirteen. I know because like, oh, as back. I did it as I did an update, I had the score wrong. Oh, I think you probably I, got yelled at. I, uh, no, no, I won't. Not no one yelled at me personally, but I went. But I went back and like uh, made sure it was right. I figured the rabid Milton fans were were coming after you. Well, actually, it's funny you say that. Um, an acquaintance of mine from college is a, uh, one of the position coaches at Milton. So nice. So I was like, like oh, I want to get that right because that's really because then like the first thing I see on Twitter is a picture of him laying on the ground like with his, <laughs> his headset all over the place I'm like he's having a good time i want him to be happy like, that's right, awesome that's right oh um, so, yeah i can't days how much of, fun that is oh i know two days of georgia high school football championships uh again john said he was alive and that was 20 minutes ago things could have changed so <laughs> we'll see if john joins us and we can catch him up on everything that's happened over the last couple of days. We'll get everybody else caught up on all of the actions around the league from the last couple of days. But we were we were asked to talk about something, um, a post that has already been pulled down uh, because of chaos. Um, I think it's a whole lot of nothing, to be perfectly honest. Um Timbers Army posted a blog post on their site that was extremely critical of the Atlanta experience and what probably frustrated me more than anything, and it's the same thing when you go back to the group on ticket thing, it was just incorrect. There were so many things in it that were just wrong and misleading, and that's that's where I'll have a problem. Um talking about having to out yell the sound system uh no i've been to every game at mercedes-benz stadium and they're not playing music over the run of play if you were trying to yell after atlanta scored a goal well you're trying to out yell 70 thousand people going nuts and a train horn and everything else because that's what happens when goals are scored i I thought it was kind of just a, a sad excuse of what we don't want to see from soccer fans going forward because it gets back to that elitist exclusionary type of vibe that we're trying to get to the back burner. I'd love to see end up completely on the back burner. It's There's really not a way to truly be a better fan than somebody else. And I'm probably being yelled at if, if that guy's listening because I didn't say supporter or active supporter. I said fan. Stop. Stop policing other fans. Stop being gatekeepers. Stop doing that. Just be happy that you are part of a league right now that is having these types of scenes because it didn't happen 10 years ago. Uh, 11 years ago, I can tell you what MLS Cup was like because I was there. It was at RFK Stadium, which was already starting to fall down by that point. It had the New England Revolution and Houston Dynamo, 30,000 people in a 55,000-seat venue. Uh, I had tickets in the upper deck. There were seats all around me. You had maybe a 1,000 tops uh, New England fans and about a 1,000 Houston fans. Uh, You had almost as many Philadelphia fans who didn't even have a team yet. That's what was going on at your cup final in 2007. 2009, it was in Seattle. It was exciting because Seattle was exciting after their first year in the league. 
but you did not have a huge number of RSL fans or Galaxy fans there. Uh, you had more Portland fans in Atlanta than you had fans of both of those teams in Seattle, from what I could tell. Look, it's come a long way. Stop trying to put limits on it. Stop trying to say that that it's not okay to have a train horn. Stop trying to say that it's not okay to have a PA announcer who is loud and excited because I've heard that in other places too. Stop trying to say that your way is better than somebody else's way because there's not some book about how to be a fan. It's one of those things that has to change in American soccer, 100%. Um, Jarrett, we had a conversation yesterday on Twitter. There was... As this was, was making the rounds and we were sitting back and trying not to laugh during the whole conversation, there was a question that came in. Uh, somebody said something about how diverse the Atlanta fan base is and talked about uh, the conversation went into a few different places about you know Atlanta being diverse and this group being diverse and other fan bases maybe not being so diverse. And somebody asked a question, and I don't know if they were trying to start something or not, about what Atlanta does to attract, what, was the term they used country folks? No rednecks. Did they say Plenty redneck? Much. I couldn't remember if Pretty they were sure trying to be redneck. politically correct and not say redneck. Um, Pretty sure it was redneck. You know what's funny, though, is what Atlanta United does to attract country folks, rednecks, uh, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, European, men, Everyone. women, kids, adults, everybody. You know how they do that? They don't try to attract anybody specifically. It's just, it's just open and inclusive. It's a crazy concept. It's wild that you just put on a good product and you make it open for everybody to come to. And your supporters group absolutely embrace that mentality. It's a crazy concept, Jarrett. I, I, I don't know if it's, it could ever happen again, but just making it open for everybody to be part of it and feel like they're part of it actually works. Yeah. Um, don't, get, uh, oh, don't get too theoretical on people here. It's crazy. I know. It's a wild idea. I'm sure there for, were for millions themselves. and millions of dollars spent on focus groups to figure this out. I'm, I'm sure that happened. Uh, y'all really does mean all. <laughs> it really, truly does. Yeah, and it was... <sighs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah. They took the post down. It was, they did. The damage was done. Uh, Timbers Army put out a statement. I think the best reply I saw to that was, wow, this statement about the post seems rather, seems rather active as opposed to being passive. And everyone just kind of went, okay, well... <laughs> That, that's nicely We're done, done here. We're done here. Let's that just, is nicely done. Let's let, let's let just let the sleeping dogs lie at this point. And, damn, damage is done. Everyone everyone go home. Yeah, I mean, and and this goes, I think, for for Atlanta fans as well. And I haven't seen as much of this, but hey, we people are on a championship high at this point, so nobody can, is a better fan base than anybody else. You you have can, different can, fan bases. Go ahead. Conversely, um, if you told me if you told me Atlanta went cross country, lost a tough game, and I had to go back from Portland to Atlanta, um, you're probably going to find some fans of every fan base that on Oregon Trail esque travel can uh, can drum up a manifesto if they feel so inclined. So. Don't think Portland's the only one who's capable of this. Every fan base is capable of something like this. In terms of your, every fan base has those fans. We have this conversation about college football a lot. I think mm-hmm. um, best you can do is just <laughs> just be there for them and say, "Please don't do this." So yeah, uh, I think John is alive ish. I hear a rumor that John Nelson is alive. John, did you see this post at all before it was pulled down, or? Were you uh, ankle deep in uh, watching Eagles Landing Christian drop 44 second half points on Athens Academy? I, I read the screenshot, so I, I I have seen the stupidity, and the stupidity is is theirs. Yes. Well, it's gone now, so I mean, yeah. they, they did realize that. It look, it, it's just something that 
soccer in this country has to understand that this type of attitude, and I, I can tell you specifically from experience, this type of attitude is what turns people off from the sport. 100% yeah. because I've been told that to my face. I've been told that from media folks who are not covering soccer but are wanting to embrace it. This type of attitude is one reason why it's hard for them to do it. This is one reason why it's hard for fans to get involved in it. There is not some book about how to be a proper soccer fan, and if there is, burn it, because it's not valid to every place. That's why you don't want Portland fans to sound like Chicago fans, to sound like Atlanta fans, to sound like Boca Juniors fans, to sound like Manchester City fans, to sound like Borussia Dortmund fans. You should be representing your city and sounding like your fan base. And nobody from outside that fan base can truly understand what your fan base sounds like. Atlanta sounds like Atlanta. It does. Uh, If Houston started chanting, we ready, it would come off kind of strange. Now, they started chanting (laughs) drills by Paul Wall. I'd be okay with that. That'd be a whole different scenario. Or uh, want to uh, be a baller by Little Troy? I'd be cool with that too. But um, yeah, I mean that's that's what it comes down to. So don't don't get too worked up about it in terms of finger pointing. What I would just hope to see, and this is not even just an Atlanta United fan base thing, because I know we have listeners from Charleston and Greenville and Chattanooga and Nashville and Birmingham as as fan bases either are continuing to grow or starting from scratch. Just embrace your city. Embrace your city and what your city, what makes your city special. And sure, there will be similarities from other fan bases because it's a sport that has, it's similar in different places. But find what makes your city special and don't let anybody tell you how to be. Be you. Be your group. Do your thing and find your voice. And when you see people do something like this, I mean, if you're from the South, you're, you're probably going to say, bless your heart and move on because there's no point in arguing it because it's, it's just, it's just foolish. So I'm glad Timbers Army took it down. I'm, I'm still disappointed with some of the voice coming out of Timbers Army official throughout this whole process. Uh, the drum thing, I have no idea. What happened with that? I, I can't speak on it. I don't know what was promised. Love an answer on that. Who, yeah, I don't know who made decisions. I have no idea. But the ticket thing, the fact that you post a group on Fan Exchange uh, screenshot and try to say that people are selling tickets on Groupon because they don't want to sell tickets to Portland, that is just factually incorrect and misleading and trying to create something that's not there. This post was trying to do that too because there were so many things that were just not factually correct in it. Portland is an absolutely outstanding fan base and don't let this one voice tell you otherwise. But these are the types of opinions that I know I've been pushing back against for decades. And I hope they retreat to the fringes because this is not what American soccer should be. Best thing I can say, do you. You be you. Let everybody else be everybody else. And don't judge because of the flavor that's invested in you know, your own fan base. And just sit there and acknowledge it for what it is and appreciate the fandom for what it is in each individual market. It's just that's just how it should be, and that way everything moves forward and the sport improves and everybody learns about everybody else. Remember the whole inclusion thing. That's what this is all about. It's about acceptance, and it's about understanding what makes other fan bases other fan bases. Don't, don't judge. But the sad thing is not all fan bases are built on that, and, and that's, a, that's a sad fact, and it's something that American soccer has to get better at. It absolutely has to get better at. If you're going to shout that, if you're going to talk about that, you have to be about that. And what's been so impressive is Atlanta has been about that from day one with all of the supporters groups, uh, whether they're official or unofficial. The Gulch is a special place on a game day. Um, Watch parties are special because of how diverse it is and how just flat-out cool it is. So 
that's what American soccer should be. Don't let these types of voices be American soccer. Um, it's not about yelling and, and calling them out. It's about showing what American soccer truly is. And I think Atlanta's done an amazing job of that. And I hope that everybody continues to do it because it is pushing American soccer forward. And the people who have a problem with it are going to make blog posts and they're going to yell and they're going to scream on Twitter and they're going to say things and look foolish and uh, just smile and nod. I mean, that's all you can do because what's more important is pushing everything forward, not holding it back. Let's take a quick break. We'll uh, see if John can get some more Mountain Dew in his system. <laughs> He's jumping up and down. Maybe a kickstart. Might have to send him a Red Bull. We'll figure all this out. For real? We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Stay with us. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative, and that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking it questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky and Associates, LLC, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Welcome back. Soccer down here, December 13th. I see we've hit on something that's got some legs to it. So we'll, we'll keep going a little bit as we have a couple of quick responses on the Twitter. If you guys have Thursday thoughts, share them with us on Twitter at Soccer Down Here. Use the Thursday thoughts hashtag. Um, El Mataflo has found the perfect gif for John Nelson. Um, I had never seen Uh-oh. this one, and I'm really disappointed that I had not seen it because it makes perfect sense uh, from Talladega. It is. Well, it's, it's tagged to you, so look at your Twitter, sir, and you can find it. Oh, okay. So you want me to do that, huh? Yes, you got to do that. Josh Eisenberg uh, shared the Timbers Army tweet, the statement about that blog post, and, and we will read that to give it proper uh, in case you guys don't know what happened and you're wondering what we're talking about. Timbers Army tweeted uh, yesterday at 129, from time to time, we solicit blog posts from members as a way to showcase the many voices within our org. Upon further reflection, some of the ideas and language contained within the blog post did not reflect the values or our organization, and we've removed the post. Our mission is to support soccer from the grassroots level to the highest professional levels, and we acknowledge that every group may approach their support differently. It's, it's kind of terse. I mean... Um, Look, I'm sure there are plenty of people within Timbers Army, again, which is an outstanding group that has done so much good for this game and this league, that did not like that that post at all. I, I saw Timbers Reddit start to kind of turn in on itself as this was starting to spread. So, Which is the most ahead. amazing thing when a subreddit starts to go into re- to Civil War mode. Yeah. Man, that's always a really interesting interesting site if you've never seen that before <laughs> yeah that was happening with this one um it, it's 
you just have to be careful when you have an organization. And, and Timber's Army, now, I don't know all of the details of how things are sorted out supporters group-wise in Portland. I know they have different groups and they have different identities. Timber's Army is the overall collective where there is a smaller group, I believe the 107 ist that is actually your your ticket buying group and your group that interfaces with the front office and I believe there are other subgroups underneath Timber's Army. It's a little complicated. So Timber's Army is a little bit more of a collective as opposed to like a functioning group. Like it would be the equivalent of the hype depot if if you had the hype depot speaking for Resurgence Terminus Legion, Footy Mob and Faction. If I'm wrong, correct me, but I believe that Timber's Army as an organization, and I'm assuming that would include their website and social media profiles, is, is larger than just a supporters group. So, I just picture them as the anarcho-syndicalist commune from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Wow, that's a reference to 22 <laughs> on Thursday pull. morning. That's a good poll this morning. All right. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, it, that's one of the greatest it, scenes ever, sir. It, it is. It's, uh, man, it's, uh, it, this stuff, it, it is a conversation that needs to be had, and for that, I'm thankful that it is being had. I hope it's not a conversation that needs to be had for a whole lot longer, because just judging other fans on how they fan is, is a little silly. Uh, Waffle House United has a, a good comment here. Coming from a 100-year-old baseball stadium converted to a soccer pitch into a state-of-the-art soccer facility is quite a shock to most Timbers fans, I'm sure. The audio-video experience is night and day. And I don't get the the best uh, exposure to the audio-video experience. I mean, our windows are up, but as I tell you all many times, we have to turn the sound down in our headphones so I can actually hear Mike and call a game. Um, I don't get all of the video experience. I've heard and seen posted from quite a few people that it was more intense on Saturday yes. than normal. It was a final. It's kind of to be understood. Um, it was a big occasion. I, I'm assuming it was probably a little more on the lines of the All-Star game than a regular season match or a playoff match for Atlanta United. It's a big venue, and we've talked about it before when you compare a band that goes from playing a club or a theater to a stadium. They have to take a different show in there. They have to act differently. They have to project to people in the back row. You can't take your Fox Theater setup, if you're playing the Fox, and teleport it over to Mercedes-Benz Stadium and do the same show because it would be swallowed up. Your backdrop would be swallowed up by a gigantic stage, and nobody would be able to tell what's going on. So in a bigger venue, you have to do different things. In a smaller venue, you do different things. That's something that does also need to be understood, and you're just dealing with a, a larger group of people. So things have to be handled differently. That's just what it comes down to. So I hope this fades away, and, and I hope people don't hold long-time grudges against the Timbers Army and Portland Timbers fans because, by and large, they're great. Every fan base has people who are loudmouths and say things that the rest of the group is kind of like, eh. even Atlanta. Everybody has it. Hopefully it doesn't get posted on the official group's stuff. Or you can just do like I do and just blame them a less when everything gets weird. Like, wow. oh, something's... <laughs> This is really loud. This is this. This is that. This is confusing. All that jazz. Yeah, just do what I do and just yell at MLS in general. Like, just blanket statement. Like, damn it, MLS. The Jared Smith finger wag. Yes. Uh, Marshall Voigt had a question, and this is from our pre-match show on 92.9, the game, which I believe is up on... The Off the Woodwork folder and on the 92.9 The Game website, I think. Um, if it's not, it will be. Uh, kind of weird to go back and listen to it now before the game, but we had some great conversations that are worth checking out. And Marshall Voigt asked, he said, Speaking of trying to put limits on things, who was it y'all were interviewing before the game on 92.9 that was saying how he wished Atlanta would build a smaller stadium with grass? I'm curious if you got his thoughts post-game. 
Uh, I haven't got his thoughts post game. It was Jordan Culver from Orlando. Uh, we will have him on here in a bit, uh, not today, but soon when Orlando officially announces their new general manager, which is another topic we'll get into in a little bit because there's weird things going on with Orlando and Dallas right now. But Jordan said that, and I was I was a little fired up when he said it. I think Charlie Bohm nailed it, though, with more about hoping there was grass as opposed to turf, as opposed to building a separate stadium. Um, you're not going to see a separate stadium. There's absolutely no reason to do it. It's the same conversation that's come up in Seattle numerous times. If you have control of the venue, and, and yes, sharing it is still having control, if you have control of the venue and you're making money in the venue, why would you go to another venue when you don't need to? Atlanta United's not going to do that, and I don't think they need to. I think if you had, Atlanta United would not be as special as it is because you would have built the 25,000-seat stadium. At one point, they looked at Kennesaw. They, I heard they looked at locations in Johns Creek. I heard they looked at locations in Gwinnett, probably around where Coleray Field is. Um, I know at one point the Falcon Stadium was going to be at the old GM plant at Doraville. At least that was an idea. I don't know if that was going to be a combined soccer and NFL. I was bantered around by fan NFL. bases, I know, for a long time. Yeah, I think there was some legs to it. Um, I don't know how far they got. And I don't know if Atlanta United or soccer was an idea at that point. I don't remember the timeline, but... Doing it this way is what's made it so big because it it does go back to something that I will always remember, and I'm glad he said it again when I was on with him Friday night. Andy Bunker did morning radio in Portland. Uh, He was there when the Timbers won the title in 2015. The conversation on the morning show when they started the next day was, is this a big deal? Should we keep talking about it? And the answer was no. And they talked about it for another segment. And that was it. They did not cover a parade. They did not have uh, people in a parade. They did not have their midday show at the celebration. All of these things. The reason why these things happen, the reason why uh, at least three different local TV stations covered a parade and talked about it, The reason why all of this happened is because it's at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It is treated like a big deal, and it is a big deal. When it's a smaller deal, when you're playing at a twenty to 25,000-seat stadium, it is much easier to ignore it and say it's not as big of a deal. That's a fact. That's something that people have to come to grips with. Everybody wants to ignore that, but that is a big part of it. It is a very big part of it. So... I, no, I would disagree with Jordan, and, and it was a fast-paced show. I didn't get a chance to, to do that because this was an opportunity to talk to, to two people from outside the area and get their thoughts. But, yeah, I, I think it'd be foolish to build a smaller stadium when you're not even selling this one out 100% every game. And Darren Eels has said that's the goal. That's the goal to get the fan base where you want it to be, get the atmosphere where you want it to be, to where you just open the building up and boom, there you go. You got 70000 a game all the time. That's where Atlanta United's thinking. Not about building something smaller. Not doing what Major League Baseball has done here lately where they're building smaller parks. Not any of that. They're wanting to go bigger. So, that's, again, it's, it goes back to this discussion that I, I think we're going to have a lot in the off season. There are people who are involved in soccer in this country who are afraid of getting too big. Flat out. And Atlanta is scaring them. Atlanta is scaring a lot of people around the country in terms of soccer because it is so big. And people always have that fear that it's going to collapse, that there's going to be a bubble that bursts. I honestly think those days are done. And I think it's it's foolish to think that way. And... I'm coming at it from, you know, my nonprofit experience where, you know, when you're growing a nonprofit and a sports team is not a nonprofit, but mentality is the same. 
once you start to settle, once you start to say, we're good, we're not going to try to grow anymore, we're, we're good, we're just going to maintain and coast for a little bit, that's when things start to fall apart. You always have to look to grow. You always have to look to get bigger. You're going to lose support if you don't. If you project that you're happy where you are, you're content, you're, you're, you're going to fail. So soccer has to get past this. Well, okay, we're good here. We're good here. We're, we're good. We don't want to get too much bigger because then that's scary. Get scared. <laughs> Be scared. Um, get a dog if you're scared. But then get past it and move on and grow this thing. Because now is the time. 2018, 2026, it's not that far away. You keep growing to that, and you keep building the foundation alongside it. And when you have a World Cup, the biggest World Cup in all time, because that's what that one's going to be, I mean, just in sheer number of teams and games and all of it, you have that here, whoo, you're talking about a whole nother world for soccer in this country. But you have to keep growing, and you have to keep preparing for it. And you can't get scared, and you can't try to retreat, and you can't pull back. It, it's time to, to do this. All the work that everybody has done to grow soccer in this country has gotten you here. I don't want to look at you know, attendance and MLS Cup and records and see Atlanta at the top forever. I want to see other people get in that mix. I want to see it push. I want to see Dallas decide, you know what, we're going to have a game at Jerry World because this is going to be a big opportunity for us to bring a big crowd. I want to see teams think like that. I, I want to see the Red Bulls say, you know what, we have a huge game coming up. We're going to have this at MetLife. And don't say, well, we can't fill it. You've got to continue to try to build it and get to the point that you can do these things. That's where I'm at. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm in Atlanta and I've, I've been watching this from day one go from an idea to something that I could not have even dreamed of. But I'm not afraid of it. I don't think it's going to fail. I don't think it's going anywhere. That's that's where we're at now. And, and I hope the rest of the country catches on board with that soon. Uh, let's take a quick break. Come back. More Thursday thoughts after this. Sweet strawberry icing. You're in goodwill and just past that vintage denim jacket you spot. Miniature donut earrings. You lean in. Ah, oh, that's the scent of shopping success. Because at Goodwill, every item you buy funds local job training and more. So bring home those donut earrings and bring home so much good to your community. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. I mean, you know, I love him. Hamilton the pug, Instagram star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States and the Ad Council. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer down here. Thursday Thoughts edition of the show. And as you know, if you listen on a regular basis, the, the Thursday and Tuesday Thoughts editions can sometimes go into the Jack Andy Deep Thoughts. And I think that's where we're kind of getting. Um, 
it's good. It's good. I like to have these conversations. I, you know, I, I hope you all know at the end of the day, I just want to see soccer continue to grow and become a bigger part of the sporting landscape in this country like it has here in Atlanta because I want everybody else to experience this. Um, Lewis Martin with a great tweet. He says he had a Twitter conversation with the writer of that 107 is post at Timbers Army. And the writer seemed to acknowledge his generalizations. He's a man in his 60s and having to adjust to other fan bases taking the shine off of his club. He's better than his blog post. And yeah, I would I'd completely, you know, I'm not surprised by that. I, I think sometimes when we write and when we're frustrated about something, uh, you need to not post it immediately and you need to let it marinate for a minute. And that's probably the situation here. Portland's a great club. And Portland is a club that is very, very important for the growth of this league because you can't – it's really hard to have a whole league of Atlantas. Portland's not as big as Atlanta. But Portland plays a very, very valuable role. And what they do across the board, what they do with the Portland Thorns, what they do with their USL team, they're building something special. And they have a ton of history that, that other clubs don't. And that's a great thing. Um, they need to continue to grow as everybody does. Don't settle and don't think that your way is the way that everybody else should do because Portland and Atlanta are two very, very different places. Very, very different places. And the the support in those two places should not sound the same. No. See, and this is what happens when... I go Rip Van Winkle on the show for four days is that I have all of this catching up that I have to do and I'm hearing all of this stuff for the first time. So basically my Thursday thoughts are a combination of wall pass Wednesday and Tuesday thoughts and anything that I missed while I was down in the down in the rabbit hole chasing after everything else. Nice. That's all good. That's what we're doing. Um, you're getting all jacked up on Mountain Dew. So things are, are good. No, well, I might be getting jacked up on Mountain Dew, but the uh, the vocal cords are uh, kind of sitting there going, "Yo, dog, um, not today." That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. You can you can try to go Luther Vandross on it. That's okay. Um, yeah. The the colonel points out that you know, as we said, to be fair, a, a lot of the comments on the blog post from Timbers Army members and fans uh, took exception to that take. So, yes. Um, <laughs> okay, I did not see this one. Uh, one Chris Berry on Twitter tweeted and said, somebody in the Facebook fan group suggested playing MLS Cup in Sanford Stadium and got ripped apart. It showed just how <laughs> divisive we can be for college football, but unified when it comes to Atlanta United. Um, I I love Sanford Stadium, obviously. I, I went to school there. But I think folks are still mad about the hedges being removed for the 96 Olympics. There are some people who are still upset about that. Um there's no well, yeah, there is a reason. I mean, you could get a, a few more thousand people. You get about twenty thousand more people in there. That's mm-hmm. true. Um, we got the same number well, of titles since nineteen eighty two. Now, yeah, this is also true. Thanks, Jarrett. Appreciate that. Um, <laughs> no, you you don't want to you don't want to do that because while I said you know I'd love to see Dallas play at Jerry World for a game or Red Bulls play there, I think at first. That is a special event, like what San Jose's done, where they've played games at Stanford. They've played the Cali Classico at Stanford because it's a big deal. Your cup game, until you get to a point where you're considering playing at a bigger venue permanently, your cup game's got to be in your home, in your house. So, yeah, and, and it does show what Chris, I think, is hinting at bigger here is that idea that Atlanta United has pulled together all of the Georgia and Tech and Alabama and Auburn and Tennessee and Florida and all those fans who live in the metro Atlanta area behind Atlanta United, just the same as it has for all the different NFL fans and all the different baseball fans and all the different NBA fans and the hockey fans who don't really have anything to watch, all of them can come behind Atlanta United and support Atlanta United. People who have been in Atlanta but do not connect with Atlanta sports teams because they have fans of uh, their fans of other teams now can feel connected to the city. And that's really important. Um, that's a unique thing. I don't know. There are other cities that are very transient like Atlanta, but I don't know if that's ever truly been captured in other cities. No. And some of it is just because yeah. Atlanta United is so big and it's treated as such a big yeah. deal. Yeah, Mark I mean, Griggs still lost control of Franco Escobar's left foot. Yes, he has. 
uh, and I never want him to that. get control of that lethal weapon because even Joseph's kind of like, yeah, that's his goal scoring foot, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, I did not see what El Mataflo is referring to uh, about civil wars within supporters groups. And now I guess the Atlanta ultras are having issues about the silverbacks. Um, oh, okay. It was because of the watch party. If, if you don't know the whole situation there, it is so complicated and it would really need a five part mini series on GPB to try to break it all down um, about 10 hours of programming to try to make any of this make sense. It Ken um, burns to do it and yeah. then do it factually and correctly. It, there's that. Um, there are differences between the silverbacks club ownership and silverbacks park ownership. Although I believe there are shared links, but the team is separate than the park and they don't always work together as you've seen Games have to be played in other places than Silverbacks Park. Uh, if you know, you know the Silverbacks were a professional club for a long time um, before they did not have the money to continue to operate as a professional club. And they stopped doing that, and they've still participated in the NPSL. Um, it, it's such a wonky thing. I have not understood the... Atlanta Ultras just hate for Major League Soccer and, and what's going on here. I, I I honestly hate it for them because they chose to support a club that just didn't have the resources to do much and honestly didn't have the decision-making to maximize the resources they had. Um, it really wasn't until the last front office that the Silverbacks had that I think they, they had a group that could have taken the team places. But that group had zero money to work with. I mean, I I can attest to that. I can tell you that one straight up because I saw it and watched it. It's uh, it's a shame, but to to be this way about it, I mean, I'm not them, so I I don't know. I I'm not gonna say they're wrong. I just I think it is a little silly to not support the club that you've always supported, which is the Atlanta Silverbacks, because Silverbacks Park, which is under different ownership and operated by different people decided to publicize a watch party for people who come out essentially to play in their leagues and play in the Latin leagues who might not have had tickets to MLS Cup. Um, the only people that think it's a rivalry are, are the Ultras and, and that group. And I hate that it's like that because these are some good fans who've supported their team through absolute thick and thin and put a lot of time and love and blood, sweat, and tears into it. And I hate that they feel left out. Um, I don't think anybody at Atlanta United wanted to leave them out, and, and I hate that they've been let down by their club. And, and I don't think being let down by their club had anything to do with this watch party. That's not what let them down. It was the fact that I don't think the club ever was able to be what the Ultras wanted them to be. So these are the kind of things that happen sometimes in American soccer and in these discussions. And there's a lot of backstory. I think if you look at stuff on the surface, it can be really weird and hard to understand. There's usually a lot of backstory and a lot of things behind the scenes that, that lead to these things, like the blog post from Timbers Army, like the ultra's frustration with Atlanta United. And you just have to do you again. It just do what you do. Enjoy what you enjoy. Watch what you want to watch support in the way you want to support that's what this game is all about it's not about somebody telling you how to enjoy something or how to feel about something feel the way you feel enjoy it the way you enjoy it that's all that matters let's see who else is up um thursday thoughts oh uh, folks are talking about what's going on up in ottawa too Oh, that's another complicated one. So we're going to save Ottawa for a minute. We're going to save Sherbs' comment for a minute. Um, let's leave this segment here. Uh, even yep. at the 40,000-seat setup, and this is from Chris Burns, Impact Local 1. Even at the 40,000-seat setup, Atlanta United can bring in $1 million more per game than average MLS teams. Double that for the six events at 70000 next season. That's $17 million more revenue. In a salary cap world, how can Atlanta reinvest that money? Player acquisition fees, etc. Please educate us. 
designated players. That's why you're seeing Atlanta be willing to spend $15 million on a transfer fee for Ezekiel Barco because they can. Um, the rumored numbers around PT Martinez, same thing. They can invest it in academy, and that's why the, the academy is so robust. Um, they can reinvest it in just the the staffing and professionalism of both the, the front office staff, the technical staff, the everything, everything around it, the medical staff, all of it. Um, it just keeps going back into that. So I'm trying to think of how else they can. Uh, I mean, discretionary TAM, everybody has that option. Atlanta obviously has no problem spending an extra $2.8 million in discretionary TAM because of these types of numbers. And this isn't even getting into sponsorships. This isn't getting into, um, you know, merch sales. This isn't getting into concessions sold at the stadium. This isn't getting into any of that type of stuff. So as the Forbes piece, when it talked about the valuations, you know, kind of hinted at, yeah, Atlanta United, according to Forbes, lost money in 2017. A lot of that was due to the amount they had to pour into Bobby Dodd Stadium and rent Bobby Dodd. You get a whole season of playing at, mercedes-benz stadium and bringing in a bigger average and having those full venue games and having three postseason games to do to do all this um yeah the the numbers are going to be shocking to some i think when this comes out next year and and you start to see what atlanta united truly did in 2018 from a revenue standpoint it's it's a brand new world and it's something that I hope other other clubs can find ways to get into these ballparks and to get into these types of scenarios where they're making this kind of money. Then you don't see the you, you don't see teams fearing having three designated players or paying big transfer fees or any of that. So it'll continue to grow. It just it takes time. Atlanta's in a unique spot, and I would think they're going to take full advantage of it. Let's take a quick break. Let's come back. We've got a couple uh, very deep thoughts to dig into. One is north of the border in Ottawa. The other um, is still about fan culture and all that. And we'll, we'll get into all of it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds. And most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking it questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Wrapping up our number one here on Soccer Down Here. Thursday Thoughts, December 13th. Jason Longshore, John Nelson, Jarrett Smith with you this morning. Felipe Cardenas will be joining us at 1030 in hour number two. Uh, Jarrett Smith will be leaving us in hour number two. Aw. Yeah, I mean, we just, we like to, we like to run, we like to just abandon sometimes. You know how it goes. 
Yeah, pretty much. It happens. It's all good. Um, yeah, it happens. I mean, you know, it's life. Sometimes, yeah. you, sometimes you win. Sometimes you take home the. Uh, sometimes you take home the wooden spoon after you spend a bunch of money bringing in veterans in one of the worst two way trades I've ever seen in my life. Ooh. Sometimes it rains. Ooh. Sorry, Tommy Redding. Yeah, seriously. Uh, Tom Thomas Jewin says supporters' culture is just weird, y'all. Just accept it as being weird and do whatever makes you happy. It is about like navigating the high school lunchroom. That that's kind of what it reminds me of. It at yes. many many points is if you just get dropped into a new high school lunchroom, it will blow your mind as to where to sit. Just sit where you want to sit and enjoy it. That that's pretty. Yes, I do have right. watched Mean Girls. <laughs> there you go. One of the most one of the most important films sure. of our. Well, hey, one of the most important films of our uh, of my age, anyway. My I, can, I can't else. decide if supporters' culture is more like Mean Girls or more like Breakfast Club. I, I'm not sure which one captures it mean better. Girls. I think they both fit just for different age groups. I mean, yeah, they do. I think Breakfast Club right does answer. get get a lot of it too. So. There's so many of those high school coming of age uh, movies that make me think of American soccer supporters culture, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's it's funny. Um, Chris uh, Chris C. Rob Chris Crob, I'm not sure which way we go with it. We're gonna we're gonna go with both. It says it's really a modern speakers versus tin cans string issue at this point. Uh, talking about the stadiums and Portland versus Mercedes Benz, it's it's just two different things. Um, Chewy, I see your tweet. We'll get to you in a second. Uh huh. Uh, yep. Uh, Sherbs, this is a, a Jack Handy deep thought for sure. Sherb says, Y'all's Thursday thoughts on Kim's take regarding the old soccer's guard hate on Atlanta stemming from taking away their thing and making it more accessible. And Jared, I think you alluded to this in, in the first segment. Uh, this was all spinning off of the blog post from Timber's Army. And and I, I don't think this was the intent of the writer at all. I, I don't think this was it. I think this is a different issue, but I don't think this was the intent of that writer. Uh, Kimberly McCauley at SB Nation said, a lot of liberal white people gravitated to soccer because it was overwhelmingly white without being the slightest bit redneck. And those people subconsciously hate that America's new soccer darling is welcoming to black folks and country folks. That's a bold statement. Um... I'm not going to speak for everybody. I, I'm not ever going to try to do that. But American soccer is not as diverse as it should be. And I think we talk about this in a lot of ways on the player side and on the player pool side in youth soccer. But that's a reflection. And what's happening here is different. It, it is a little different. Um, it's good to see. I, I don't know if that, that's why some people are hating on Atlanta. I don't know if that's what it is for them. I don't know if they know that's what it is for them, for some people. I don't know if they even get that. But um, America's new soccer darling is absolutely welcoming to black folks, country folks, Latino folks, all kinds of folks. And that's just the new reality. That's what American soccer should be. I hope other places embrace that. I want to see that. I don't want to see what it was like here 10 years ago when the Latino soccer culture in Atlanta was a completely separate thing by itself, off to itself, and was awesome. But you didn't know about it unless you really had to go look for it. And it was very welcoming when you found it. I never felt out of place being, a lot of times, the only gringo on the field when we were running teams in League of Lawrenceville and Georgia Soccer League uh, in tournaments, I, I never felt out of place or felt people were looking at me sideways, but you had to go really try to find it. Now that's not the case. Like You look into the crowd and you see all of Atlanta. I hope that doesn't scare people. If it does... You just got to look in the mirror sometimes and, and reflect what your issues are here. I, I really hope that this is a new way forward for soccer in this country. What do you think, Jared? Oh, man. Um, a lot of times you need kid gloves for these kind of things or welder's gloves even to handle these topics because they can get yeah, out of the hand ladder. really, 
really quickly. Um, look, I mean, and Jason, uh, you and I have different views on have a different view on this from some people because of work history, and you have a different view than I do because you had a longer work history with it, with soccer in the streets about what it can be, um, and even just what it can be community to community. You know, it was a different approach when you go out to Clarkston versus, you know, when you go out to you know west of Mercedes Benz Stadium mm-hmm. inside the city. It's a different approach. You know, culture is different. People take things differently. They execute life differently. And it's one of those things where I think you really do have to come into it with arms and eyes open. You know, and that means, you know, going to the tailgate, go walk around at the tailgate. Get outside your comfort zone. It's fine. No one's going to be upset at you. Get outside the ta- get outside your comfort zone. Go find uh, Parceros with Sombreros or um, Sempre United. Or well, I, was, I was I was told that I might get a, parse, a, a sombrero from the Parceros. Oh, I was see. very excited about that. I ran into them at the celebration as I was running to get on radio, and and I was told I might get a sombrero. So I am perfect. I am so pumped. Strong. And Atlanta is such a diverse place. Atlanta doesn't happen, in my opinion, the way it does, the way it did without this level of inclusion because of the way Atlanta is designed and the way Atlanta has grown as a city demographically. You had to be like this for this to happen. You couldn't be exclusive at any capacity whatsoever if you wanted Atlanta MLS to be what it has become. It was never going to happen without the you know, without this this openness and willingness for, for all. And I don't even think for a lot of people, I don't think it's you know, a blatant sense of prejudice or, you know, trying to be exclusionary or trying to be, you know, a gatekeeper. I think it's just a matter of what you're comfortable with and then seeing something new and kind of being on the back foot for it for a second, having to adjust. I don't think it's, I don't think it's intentionally malicious by anybody to be a gatekeeper or not, not by everybody to be a gatekeeper, maybe some people, but I don't, for, I think for a lot of people, it's not intentional. I think it's just kind of that reactionary. This is how we've always been. So, you know, we've got to adjust and change the way we think and we, you know, accept that new cities are going to come in because you're going to have a different demographic in Atlanta. Nashville is going to be a different demographic. Mm-hmm. Miami's going to be a different demographic. Austin, when they get in, you know, when Precourt does his thing, which will be amazing because then we all have a villain we can cheer against. Didn't Anthony Precourt? <laughs> Charlotte, if they get one, that's a different demographic. You imagine you start putting together like youth programs in Kinston, North Carolina? Whew. It's uh, it's a different landscape. It's it's a new time, and we'll we'll continue this conversation in hour number two. It's Thursday thoughts. It's your show. You share your thoughts with us. We'll discuss. We'll talk about it. Uh, John, I'll get your thoughts on this, and you get your thoughts on uh, championship trains' post and question for you as well. Jarrett, talk to you tomorrow. Appreciate it. I'm here for a little bit. Oh, um, well, he's still it, here. I'm in. It, I'm in Cocky Cafe. Extra time. He's in, in Cocky Cafe stoppage time. So okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back and continue the conversation. <laughs> On the other side, stay with us. We'll be right back. Sweet strawberry icing. You're in goodwill and just past that vintage denim jacket you spot. Miniature donut earrings. You lean in. Ah, that's the scent of shopping success. Because at Goodwill, every item you buy funds local job training and more. So bring home those donut earrings and bring home so much good to your community. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky and Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. I do not love him. 
Hamilton the Pug, Instagram star, and Shelter Pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back to Soccer Down Here. We are deep into the deep thoughts on a Thursday Thoughts edition of the show. Jason Longshore, John Nelson, Jarrett Smith. And and look, I guess the thing I would want to share with everybody is we are no gatekeepers. We don't know this better than everybody. We're not telling people how to think. I, I don't want it to ever come off that way. But this is an interesting conversation, and it's something that American soccer does need to consider. The, the most special thing about all of this to me, and, and we're talking about Kimberly McCauley's tweet from SB Nation, uh, from LGBTQFC is her, her Twitter handle. Um, the th- most special thing about Atlanta United to me is hearing from so many people that I would consider being from Atlanta. And, and that's a bit of a sliding scale. I think in other cities, it, it's, were you born here? Okay, you're from here. In Atlanta, maybe Atlanta's not so much. definitely a sliding scale. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a, a scale of are you from here or not from here. And Yes. It also depends thing, on who you're talking to. It does. It does. If that, I'm, is that person from Atlanta? Because your answer is going to vary. But I, I, am from, I can say I'm from Atlanta, even though some people would say I'm not from Atlanta because I was born uh, 30 minutes south. Southern uh, Crescent. County. I, I consider that being from Atlanta when I would talk to people. I said I was from Atlanta, um, and then I would go more specific as, as you start to have that conversation. That's generally how it works. But what I love about Atlanta United is so many people that whether they're from Atlanta, whether they're not from Atlanta, whether they've been here two years, whether they've been here 10 years, whether they've been here 20 years, because I've had people tell me that they have lived here in this city for 20 years and they never felt connected to Atlanta because they weren't a Braves fan, they weren't a Hawks fan, they weren't a Falcons fan. And yes, sports has that power to make you feel like you're from a place. It absolutely does. Atlanta United made them feel like they were from Atlanta. And I know so many people who have joined the supporters groups, come out to a tailgate, met people that were different than them from different places, different backgrounds, all of it. And it has made them feel stronger connection to the city. That's what I love about it. And that's what is maybe one of the most important things that this club is doing. But in other cities, maybe the fan base doesn't look the same. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I know there is that exclusive, exclusionary attitude around American soccer that has to to go away. John, I know you're getting caught up on all this, but what were your thoughts on uh, on this stuff? Uh, the way that... And, and I, I guess and the way that I phrase it to people is that I have dual citizenship, uh, California and Georgia, because I was born in a suburb of, Los, a suburb of Los Angeles, if I could get my upper plate to work this morning, and moved back here when I was very, very young, went to school here, grew up here, but I would spend summers with my dad in Los Angeles. So I guess you could call me a a pseudo native or something like that, where I kind of split my time and you look at what Atlanta United has done and you've given the transplants something that they can attach to from the absolute beginning. Yes. They're Steelers fans or bears fans or New York Rangers fans when the thrashers were here and don't get me down that rabbit hole, but Flyers fans, Sixers fans, whatever. They move here. They still have that attachment to the folks that they grew up watching. Atlanta United is something that transplants and natives can hook up to from scratch. 
and sit there and go, this is my soccer team. And this is my soccer club. And these are people who feel the same way that I do. And so it's, it's a, a unique symbi- a symbiotic relationship that has been created with Atlanta United. And I, I know that there are some natives here to this particular part of the United States that sit there and haven't quite gotten attached to soccer. They have their thing. You know, they're a baseball fan or they're a football fan. They're a college football fan. But what we've seen here is just a very unique confluence of a whole lot of different things. And when you're building something from scratch, it's best to build something from scratch when everyone can be involved. And it doesn't matter how tall you are, how short you are, what the color of your skin is, what your financial background is, you know, what you what you do on a daily basis. And it's just for me, it has been tremendous to see everyone throw their collective weight behind Atlanta United. And it doesn't matter really what you look like, what you wear, what you drive, doesn't matter. And the culmination, at least for year two in getting a title, you saw all that noise and you saw all of that just verve and energy that went right behind it. And and I think that it's setting an example an example. It's not the example. And I think that's the point that we want to make here every single time that something like this comes up on the show. It is an example of what can be. And in your town could be something completely different. But what you've seen in the opportunity to build something from scratch is everybody throwing everything behind it. And it's it's just cool to have all of this enveloping energy rolling itself forward and seeing this end result at the end of season two yeah it's it's pretty special um just to see so many different walks of life and and pretty much any different category you want to put people in and man i try so hard not to do that and think that way i i don't know why I'm wired that way. I honestly have no idea. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably due to my mom and just the, the way she was about being welcoming to everybody, no matter who who you were, where you're from, whatever. It just didn't matter to her. And I was lucky enough to be in a community that was not the most diverse, but had diversity. And I found soccer early on and met people from places I've never been and met people from different walks of life that I would have never experienced. And just the way of, of grouping people and, and making that preconceived notion when I see somebody, it just never, never really happened in, in my head. And, and I'm glad. And it doesn't make me better than anybody. It's just, I, I guess I think about some of this stuff a little differently um, just because of my experience. That's how everybody is. So I'm glad that this is the fan base that it is. And, and I don't know if this would happen in any other city, you know, like my, my studying of the, the history of Atlanta, I I really got into it when we moved our soccer in the streets office from Chambly into downtown and on Auburn Avenue. And I I loved that building we were in on Auburn Avenue and, and being so, you know, just in the middle of such a great history. Yeah. Just the history of old school Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Making me dodge streetcars for no money. That's fun. Yeah, there's that. I did see the streetcar wrapped <laughs> with the MLS Cup stuff uh, yesterday. I didn't know that had happened. That was pretty cool. Um, nice. But yeah, like when I when I moved down there, I wanted to to study and learn more about the history of it. And there's an outstanding book that if if you're from Atlanta and you haven't read it, it's called Where Peachtree Meets Sweet Auburn, and it talks about how Atlanta has developed into what it is i think it's still very relevant Um, it was written many years ago but i think it's still very relevant and it gives you an explanation honestly i think to why atlanta soccer culture is what it is atlanta has always been about coming together and moving forward period you didn't see the the same issues during the um civil rights era that you did in other southern cities um robert woodruff from Coca-Cola was one who always pushed the city forward. I think Arthur Blank does a lot of those things now. It's It's been a city, and and I, I want to have this conversation. It'll probably be a 1v1 here at some point once we all get a chance to rest uh, with Curtis from Footy Mob. Because we had a great yes. conversation one night after um, 
stoppage time live at Fado, and and we were talking about this and trying to put it into words. And I'm going to paraphrase what Curtis said, and we'll we'll have this conversation in a deeper way soon and, and put it out on the SDH network. But Atlanta's always been about different people from different walks of life, different groups coming together and and saying, "Yep, you got your thing. I got my thing." Can we break bread together? Can we make money together? Can we do our thing together? We can? Cool, let's do it. And that's that's been Atlanta. Um, that's Atlanta music. That's Atlanta sports. That's Atlanta as a whole. And maybe that's not the vibe in other cities. I don't know. I've lived here my whole life except for my time in Athens. So I think all of that goes into making Atlanta and Atlanta soccer culture what it is. It is welcoming to all. It is, I think, for the most part, respectful of differences in everything. Background, religion, who you vote for, any of that. I don't think any of that truly matters on a game day. And that's really cool to see, especially in the times that we're in right now where all that seems to matter far more than it should and you don't get to know people. So... Hopefully, again, this is just something that can continue to grow and, and others can learn from and, uh, and adopt in the ways that fit their communities. But it's a conversation that American soccer you know, has to have and has to be open to having. So I'm excited that Atlanta's driving that forward. It's, it's very cool to see Atlanta be such a central part of the growth of American soccer. And I hope it continues because I think they're – there are a lot of unique things about the special place that we have that can rub off on others. And, and hopefully it does. I mean, I was thinking about this yesterday, Jared, as, I, as we were driving around, cause we had talked about this post for a while and, and you know, it, it upset me to see, and it upset me to see an attack on, on the fan base and the culture of Atlanta and Atlanta soccer. But I, I, I thought back to, you know, what Darren said at his uh, championship celebration speech and pulling the Andre 3000 line from the Source Awards. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's not about being That's funny. Fine. No, hold on. It's no, remember. it's not about that. It's one second. Minute. Yeah, one second. It's, it's about, let's go back to what that was. That was Andre 3000 from Outkast after winning Best New Artist when rap and hip-hop culture was dominated by East and West, New York and California, and anything from the South was seen as crap, stupid, uh, waste of time, bad, whatever other word you want to throw there. And Outkast came out and said, uh, nope, South's got something to say. And they did. And what did you see in the decade and time since? Atlanta music inspiring and changing what music was, what popular hip hop, R and B, all that was. At first it was ah nah, this is this is Atlanta, this is from the South, this is backwoods, this is stupid. These guys can't do this. And these women can't do this because that's a huge part of it too. But they did, and then mm-hmm. everybody wanted to emulate it. And that's what happens so often. So let's see what happens in the next few years, because I could easily see a scenario where you see more supporters groups. Look at what's worked here after dissing it, after hating on it, and then adopting parts of it. I could easily see that happen. And then Atlanta has to continue to reinvent itself. And that's what the city has always been good at. And that's what popular culture in a city has always been good at. And I know will continue. So it's kind of cool again to see Atlanta leading the way in a different in a different realm now. And a point to that as well is it wasn't just Atlanta. I mean, it's a bunch of different cities in the south have their style. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh that's going to be a thing. I mean, look, we joke about Orlando all the time not being the south um whether you do or don't consider them. Orlando's gonna have to find their own way here in a bit and i would like i think as much as we rag on orlando as much as that's a rivalry it would be really fun if orlando is really good i'd like to see it like atlanta orlando games mean something for the shield that sort of thing for both teams um those sorts of situations would be great um nashville coming in 
potential. I, I, I still hold out a little bit of hope that, that the new ownership in Charlotte is able to make something happen. Um, but you're going to have more teams in the South. We see what Tormenta is doing. We see at the lower levels, uh, you know, Greenville Triumph now, you know, Chattanooga, uh, as Chattanooga is trying to find their way, which, I mean, look, that happens with teams and with cities when you bring in new teams and things get kind of sideways. I hope everything really does work out well in Chattanooga. But yep. you've got a lot going on at different levels, and you've got a lot of Southern pride. That it's it, and it's a different phrase than it used to be. Not as kind doesn't have to be as controversial as it's always been. But nope. you know, soccer in the South is going to be different, and everybody and everybody's going to put their own stamp on it. And some stamps are going to be bigger than others, but it doesn't make them more important necessarily. No, uh, Wakatata Flame, which again is is my favorite Twitter handle of all time. Uh, nails it and and drops a mic. Before Atlanta United, my Canadian wife hated soccer. My I only watched U.S. Men's National Team, so she associated us watching matches with USA chants and crowded bars. This team has made her love the sport and have jumped the Braves as her favorite team. Once the Bravos moved to the Burbs, we stopped going to games. The culture and atmosphere behind United is untouchable. Multi-game packs have been great for making us almost feel like season ticket holders, especially since we got playoff tickets before the general public. I would suggest to anyone who is not a season ticket holder but a big enough fan to listen to soccer down here to look into the six-game multi-pack for next year. And it, it might be bigger because they, I don't know what they're going to do about tickets and packs with open in the stadium. I think it'll start at six. It might end up going bigger than that based off the way things finished. Uh, but Wakatata Flame says they are for all of the games where the upper deck is open, so they are usually the best matches, which is true. Um, there, there's just so many different ways to be a part of it. And as we've stressed, you know, this fan base is not just who's in the building every game. It's people who come to these games. It's people who do the multi-game pack. It's people who watch at their favorite bar every week. It's people who watch at home and have people over every week. It's people who listen on the radio as they're driving around. Like, it's all part of it. It's all part of it. it. It's it's open. It's it's welcoming. It's there for everybody to take part in, and add to. And that's that's maybe the the thing that I've loved the most is everybody's bringing their own thing to it. Yeah. That's what's cool. Their own perspective, their own experience, just their own them into this. So it's it's a special thing. And if you don't get it if you don't understand it it might be scary to you you might look down on it you might be in another part of the country and say ah that's stupid that they're chanting the we ready the hip-hop song that's stupid well it works <laughs> and it's pretty cool when you yes. see the stadium full with the fireflies the phone lights and everybody chanting we ready in a uh kind of softer tone and it builds up it's that gives me goosebumps every time so Think what you want, but I have a feeling that you will see lots of things that are associated with Atlanta right now in terms of how to be a soccer fan that people have talked trash about. I have a feeling you're going to see some of these things happen in other parts of the world and other parts of the league, more importantly. It's, it's just what we do. <laughs> it's, it's what we do here in Atlanta, so get ready. Yeah, Two things before we go to break. Uh, to give you an example of how it has kind of impacted families, uh, one guy I know, he's a big soccer fan. He's a big uh, Tour de France guy, and he'll act, he's big into these kinds of things. He'll go to Atlanta United matches, and then for the playoffs, what he did is he got tickets for his entire family, which meant his wife and his daughters who weren't as up on Atlanta United and on the sport as – a lot of other folks may have been. He gets half a dozen seats up in the 300s. And for him, it was like an all 22. He could sit there and look at things from a higher perspective and kind of get a, a deeper idea as to how things were moving on the chessboard. He thought being up in the 300s was fantastic. For his wife and his daughters, he got to see them experience Atlanta United for the first time. And they were completely and totally wide-eyed as to how all of the fans were just getting completely and totally involved in the whole thing. And by the end of the match, they were getting involved as well, enjoying the experience for what it was for the first time. And if anyone doubts 
the impact of what the fans can be at the beginning of a match. Go watch the replay of MLS Cup. And at the very beginning, just before kickoff, John Strong and Stu Holden lay out for a little bit. And John admits that they've been to some special places and that that, that uh, the MLS Cup over at Mercedes-Benz might have been the most special leading into kickoff. And you hear in the background, and I will say that Fox did a tremendous job with their audio and bringing that to the living room or wherever you watched it. To hear 70,000 plus singing We Ready and having the knowledge to to boost that audio and to have the announcers lay out to get that feel before kick. I thought that was a great production moment for Fox. And it also was a great advertisement for Atlanta United. Yeah. Fox did a great job with the broadcast. Um, there, there were so many times that they just couldn't do interviews because it was so loud. Um, next time don't set up on the field because you will be wasting your time. It will be just too loud to do anything. If you want to do that stuff, you're going to have to do it upstairs or you're going to have to do it from the, the AT&T perch or somewhere like that because that's what this crazy group of people brings every game, and it's awesome. Let's take a break. Jared, are you still with us or are you leaving? Still an extra time. Still an extra time. Man, this is totally gone yeah. conca calf. Um, all right. This, is, this is very much a Panamanian. This is very much Panamanian. Uh, sub comes on the field to kick the ball away. There you this go. This turned into Bill Gaudet pulling his hamstring as he's about ready to take a goal <laughs> kick, time wasting. We're going to uh, take a quick break. Felipe Cardenas of the Athletic will join us at ten thirty. We will get into the Jorge Sampaoli rumors that are out there from Brazil and everything else around the Atlanta United coaching search. We'll get into all the yes stuff. Yes life. Yeah. Oh, yes. We will We will move on from our culture talk. But as always, if you guys have thoughts, share them with us on Twitter, um, at Soccer Down Here. I'm sure we'll be getting into this as the offseason continues. There will be you know time to kind of dig into these deeper conversations. Thank you for everybody just contributing and... I mean, indulging us in it, too, but also, like, contributing and, and listening and, and adding. And that's, that's been really cool to see. So thank you. Thanks. We, we have the best listeners, period. I love y'all. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking you questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Welcome back. Soccer Day on here. This will be a short segment as we get ready for Felipe Cardenas. We'll talk all your Atlanta United 
managerial rumors and innuendo. We'll get into all that next with Felipe because there's stuff to discuss. Uh, John, you mentioned the Ottawa situation, and it's weird and it's awkward. And uh, awkward. welcome to CONCACAF because it is CONCACAF's <sighs> involvement here. Very short version of the background um, here. And then, John, you can update on what's actually happening currently. So, Victor Montagliani, and I'm probably butchering his name, um, former, uh, formerly heavily involved in launching the Canadian Premier League, is mm-hmm. now the president of CONCACAF. Well, CONCACAF uh, notified the Ottawa Fury believe yesterday if not yesterday very recently I'm not sure when the actual notification happened it became public yesterday let's put it that way that they would not be certified to play in the usl in 2019 ottawa was a team that does have in their usl deal um a chance to leave to go play in the canadian premier league with no penalty they were supposed to give 12 months notice that was negotiated down to six months notice um with everybody agreeing they opted not to join the Canadian Premier League at launch, and they wanted to stay in USL. Now, they didn't really say, did they want to stay for another year? Did they want to stay forever? What was it? Um, CONCACAF, led by Montagliani, is trying to force Ottawa into the Canadian Premier League. There had been talk about Ottawa going to the Canadian Premier League. Ottawa was a North American soccer league team like FC Edmonton. They opted to go USL as opposed to sit and wait. And, and they basically said that. You know, they, they said, we don't know what the Canadian Premier League is going to be. USL has been good to us. We'd rather stay here because we know what we're doing. We know what partners we have. We're comfortable, and we want to see what the Canadian Premier League is going to be. But CONCACAF is trying to, to force the issue here. And I don't think this happens without the current president of CONCACAF leading that effort. Yeah. When you're the former president of Canada Soccer and the chief promoter of the CPL, it just uh, it has a bit of an odor to it, frankly. Yeah. Um, and, and I've seen in the, the article at The Athletic, uh, there was a question brought up about, well, what does this mean for Toronto, Montreal, what have you? Um, the Canadian Premier League is not, a top tier league and it won't be it will be equivalent to usl i don't see it going past that ever and Concacaf and canada soccer would be absolutely foolish to ruin the business of toronto montreal and vancouver to try to force them into joining the canadian premier league at any point in the next 20 years that would be uh suicide for everybody concerned it's something where I think we we always look at FIFA laws and FIFA edicts and CONCACAF rules and all these things, and we start pointing them out. But then we forget Swansea and Cardiff playing in the Premier League. We forget about Wellington Phoenix previously playing in the A-League in Australia from New Zealand and other parts of the world where this has happened too. <laughs> this, is, this is FIFA. This is CONCACAF. This is whatever confederation you want to talk about. Rules are meant to be broken, and rules are meant to be bent and shifted and re, you know, put together with masking tape when it suits anybody. And specifically, what it usually is, comes down to is money. And that's generally what's going to drive these decisions. So we will see what happens with Ottawa. I would be pretty surprised at this point if this happens for 2019. Does it force Ottawa to go into the Canadian Premier League in 2020? That seems more likely, but U.S. Yeah. is so close to having a schedule and all this done that it doesn't. Oh. I don't know. It doesn't seem to be good for anybody at this point no. to force this to happen. Not in this manner. Um, the conversation for me would be about 2020 going forward. I don't Let's know. see Mark this Gowdy. Be true. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Mark Mark Gowdy, president and CEO of the Fury's parent company says that the lawyers have requested CONCACAF immediately provide further details on the basis of the decision. We also understand Canada Soccer is seeking clarification as to the rationale for CONCACAF's decision. In the event CONCACAF does not immediately reconsider its position, Fury will take all steps, including legal proceedings, so as to ensure it will be able to continue providing professional soccer to our loyal and new fans and supporters. And then there's a quote from uh, Jake Edwards of the USL. It's wrong. 
Forcing a team to move from the league it's scheduled to play in and wants to play in three months before the season starts is unacceptable. Schedules have been set, players signed, season tickets sold. It's not fair to anyone, including the 35 other teams in our league who are being negatively affected. Allowing this to happen would set a very poor precedent. We'll do everything in our power to support Ottawa Fury FC. Yeah, I mean, you can argue about the merits of the decision, but the timing of this is is bad for everybody. That's the problem I have with it. If, if you're going to yeah. do this, do it over a regional period of time. I mean, Ottawa, don't block them from playing in USL and potentially hurt their business and potentially put them out of business by doing something like this if they don't feel like the Canadian Premier League is the right fit for them. It's a unique situation. It requires people to actually think as opposed to just look at a, a edict or whatever, but I don't even think that's what's happening here. I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think it has to do with the former you know, builder and promoter of this league being angry because Ottawa decided not to join it from day one and then not to join it now, and it feels like lashing out at that. So that has to be taken into consideration with all this stuff going on. We'll keep you posted on how it goes because it will affect Atlanta United too because they are in the same conference in the Eastern Conference of the USL Championship, and that'll be something that affects it. We will see a schedule here pretty soon for ATL UTD2. We'll keep you posted on all of that. But next, Felipe Cardenas of The Athletic. We're going to talk Atlanta United's coaching search and rumors out of Brazil, rumors out of England, uh, maybe rumors out of Argentina, maybe rumors out of Mexico. There's all kinds of stuff going on. We'll catch up with Felipe <laughs> after the break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Sweet strawberry icing. You're in goodwill and just past that vintage denim jacket you spot. Miniature donut earrings. You lean in. Ah. Oh. That's the scent of shopping success. Because at Goodwill, every item you buy funds local job training and more. So bring home those donut earrings and bring home so much good to your community. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518 350-4231 350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Ampolinski is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. How could you not love him? Hamilton the Pug, Instagram star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States and the Ad Council. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer Down Here, Thursday Thoughts edition of the show. We've got some thoughts about the Atlanta United managerial search, and we found somebody to help us think through this. Felipe Cardenas of The Athletic. What's up, Felipe? Hey, what's up, guys? Good morning. Good morning. Hey, do, morning. You get, do you ever get this, uh, take care of that sleep debt from MLS Cup yet, or are we still indebted? I think I'm finally recovered. Yeah, I was telling Jared that I left the stadium at 3.30 in the morning, Ooh, wow. uh, and the only reason I left was because I was going to be the last reporter there. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, like maybe I should get out of here with, with this last group. Uh, and, and it's funny cause I told when I would, would tell friends or just, you know, neighbors about the, the night, they're like, Oh, did you show up? Were you hung over the next day? I'm like, no, I didn't have a drop of alcohol. I stepped in it. You know, we were working. <laughs> so we wore the alcohol. Uh, we just didn't drink it. Yeah. Yeah. My, so, my, my shirt still smells like Heineken. Right. Oh. No, I, I still have that stench like in, in my, in, you know, I still smell it every once in a while, but no, it was great. It was great. Uh, I, I think I'm fully recovered. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I'm I'm pretty much there. John had to do high school football, so he has not recovered at all. He's Oof, not no. quite uh, hopped up on Mountain Dew yet. No, yes. no, <laughs> it ain't happening, brother. <laughs> All right, saw your tweet this morning uh, from Rumors Out of Brazil. It appears Jorge Sampaoli might have a job that is not going to be in Atlanta uh, with Santos. Correct, yeah. Uh, you, you know, early, you know, the, I think it was really like a few days after or the same week that Tata Martino officially made it uh, made his announcement to the club here in Atlanta that he would not be returning. Uh, and I quickly wrote a piece about, you know, what candidates Atlanta United could consider. Uh, it gave them kind of like a, a rating from like one to 10, as far as like probability. You know, uh, so some readers went at me like, that's not how you do probability. And then I was like, Hey, that's, I'm, I'm terrible at math. So <laughs> sorry about that. It's but, no um, the show. Uh, right. Yeah, I know. So, but Sampioli was on my list. Uh, the problem is that I gave him like a, a very low score, like a two out of 10 or something, because, um, I, I found it, uh, while, while tactically, yes, like you can make an argument why, uh, Jorge Sampaoli could fit into Atlanta United and, and their identity and how they play. You know, I think there's just much more that goes um, that 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 Eels is is particularly looking for. You know, he wants a club ambassador as well. I, I believe so. I'm not. You know, I don't have facts on this, but I think that that's very important to him. That someone that can get out and and represent the club in the community. Uh, and, and really be the face of this club. And I don't know if Jorge Sampioli is that guy. You know, he, he's, he's pretty volatile, um, and he has a toxic relationship with, with the press most of the time. So, uh, yeah, so I, I felt like today's announcement, um, and later Santos sent out a, a cryptic tweet yes. that was just, the, you know, the Argentina flag. Uh, so it looks like it, it's going to get done, and it's going to be a, a lucrative, a very lucrative offer for for Sampaoli, and then we'll see him back uh, in South American soccer. Okay, so then we've got to talk about the other rumor that I think caught everybody by surprise. Uh, Marcelo Bielsa has a job; he's at Leeds United, but he was linked through reports out of England to the Atlanta United job. Uh, if you don't know Marcelo Bielsa, first off, uh, please read about Marcelo Bielsa, a loco. Um, he is Tata Martino's mentor, was Tata's manager, was Mauricio Pochettino's manager, uh, San Paoli, one of his mentors, Pep Guardiola, when he was deciding to be a manager, went to his house to go sit down and talk to him, to learn from him, um, because he respected him that much. This is a you know, a, a huge name uh, in terms of, of managers around the world. BN Sports caught up with Darren Eels yesterday, and these are Darren's quotes. So this is actually from Omnisport, which I believe is a, an English outlet, but BN reported it and had this on their site. Uh, Darren said, I may have missed something, but I thought Bielsa was at Leeds. I would say that Marcelo Bielsa is incredible. I had Mauricio Pochettino when I was at Tottenham, and that Newell's Old Boys tree that comes from Bielsa is pretty incredible. He's got a lot of people and a lot of coaches who have been inspired by him. The reality is we've got a style of play in Atlanta where we score the most goals in the league. We were title winners this year, and we play an exciting, attractive style. I think it's important that the coach who comes in has a similar pedigree of playing that way. That, for us, is the most important thing. Interesting comments. Uh, mm -hmm. It was not completely just ruled out that, no, no we're not talking to him or we're not considering him. Uh, very interesting, I thought. It is, it is. I mean, Marcelo Bielsa will always be uh, at the top of a lot of man, you know, presidents' lists, even including U.S. soccer. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. a few years ago, I know that Sunil, Sunil Gulati really wanted Marcelo Bielsa, to, you know, to not only lead the national team, but I think be, you know, the, the technical director as well. Just the deal never got done. Uh, so, and, and to Darren Eel's you know, his point about the the Newell's coaching co coaching tree that is important. I think that is still um, uh, worth talking about as far as the next step for Atlanta United because you know Tata Martino leaves and 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 he leaves that he leaves a legacy, but he also brought to Major League Soccer for the very first time, if I'm not mistaken, you know that the B, the teachings of a Marcelo Bielsa. Uh, you know, I've gone down some really weird and tactical rabbit holes on YouTube where I watch uh, Marcelo Bielsa give, you know, uh, essentially like 
le- lectures to coaches um, about tactics, and and, I, and then I realize it's two in the morning, and I and I, I need to go to bed. But it's <laughs> it's it's fascinating. He 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 really is a brilliant tactician, a, a brilliant mind, uh, and he even at his at his age, I don't have his age in front of me, but he's still producing modern attack uh, attack uh, minded soccer teams and now he's doing it in with leeds united and they're they're you know they're essentially they're fighting promotion they will they if they continue you know they might be in the english premier league now the reason why i feel like it's still a long shot is because you know there are several factors one marcelo bielsa very like just like tata martino has a history of leaving teams after a year after two years mid-year um, and, and and yes, he was with Chile for 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 a while, but that was a national team. That was a cycle. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know if that's something that Atlanta United wants to continue to do. I, you know, I, I I would think that they want a manager that is here for the long term that they can depend on. So that's one. The other is, you know, just going from ment from disciple to mentor seems odd. You know, I don't know if Marcelo Bielsa would want to replace his student if you will and and then and then be uh, compared to the accomplishments of, of someone that he essentially uh, molded as a coach so that that one seems uh, a bit far-fetched but would it would it be great for major league soccer would it be great for 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 atlanta of course marcelo bielsa is is, is a brilliant mind john before you jump in uh one other Go thing about it. the bielsa rumor that does have to be considered here there are other reports as well about Leeds United and the owner's finances taking a big hit uh, with his company having a lot of problems at the moment. And Leeds, honestly, if that happens, Leeds has to get promoted this year. And they're in a good spot to do that. But if they don't, you could be looking at another huge issue with Leeds United, who has been through this over the years. If Bielsa was thinking about leaving, that could be one of the reasons why, because of the financial stability at Leeds. So, John, before you jump in, last thing about that, a great point, because that that would force him out and it would uh, essentially he would be. Yeah, it creates an opportunity for but not just for Atlanta United, for other national teams. Let's not forget there are national teams that still have not named a manager, you know, including Colombia and Argentina. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I would guarantee that both federations, especially and obviously both fans, you know, I know my group chat in Colombia. When they talk about Marcelo Bielsa, it's all full caps because they think you know, <laughs> we want Marcelo Bielsa in Colombia. So that, that opens that up. But quickly to the Newell's tree, there are other managers out there that, are, that have been at one point touched by a branch of Marcelo Bielsa. And one of those is Gabriel Heinze, who is currently a manager at, at Villa Sarfield, doing very well. He is under contract, uh, but he, he is a, new, a Newell's uh, product. He was... Um, he, he was a player for Tata Martino before Tata Martino uh, came to MLS. So at Newell's, the, the last championship that Newell's won under Tata, Gabriel Heinze was like one of the most veteran players. And he, I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that was his last stint as a player before going into coaching. So there are other unproven or somewhat unknown managers that still have links to the coaching tree that Darren Neal's referred to. Now that uh, I mean, we we should just have our own one v one section with silly season just coaching rumors and just put it <laughs> off to the side because we can go for thirty or forty five minutes. But other takeaways from MLS Cup, not necessarily on the field stuff, but off the field stuff. What still resonates with you, other than the uh, the alcohol that is still embedded in your clothing from all of the celebrations from the locker room, but. What other off-the-field stuff has still resonated with you from the weekend after the victory by Atlanta United? I would say, and I've mentioned this several times, you know, both on Twitter and, and yesterday, I had really the privilege of being on the Total Soccer Show podcast. Um, and I brought that up, that just, you know, one of the, 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 the things that will stick with me for years to come. Uh, was the opportunity to meet other journalists, other soccer writers, other soccer hosts, podcast hosts, uh, and sit with them and have a beer or, or just talk about, you know, Atlanta. You know, they, they, there's this interest in what's happening here in Atlanta and, and just being one of many, um, you know, voices that can contribute to, you know, the, the short history of Atlanta United was 
was fun. And, and also just the buzz or downtown, you know, I'm not downtown very often. And I spent, um, you know, three or four days, uh, in and out of downtown Atlanta. And it, it just really felt like a big, a big event was happening. And it felt like it wasn't the all-star type of event. The all-star event felt like, you know, uh, a party really. And there were lots of activations around town and, you know, there, there were media soccer games happening. And this one felt like, you know, at the end of the day, there was going to be a team that was very disappointed and, and another team lifting a trophy. So it felt like a final, uh, and the, you know, the buzz at the West End, you know, just MLS really did do a great job of just kind of, you know, making that the hub and the headquarters for, for everyone, uh, and, and being able to be, you know, be at the, the state of the league addressed by, by commissioner Garber what was interesting, just like the setting and the, and, and the amount of, journalists uh, that were there i think from all over the world i spoke to journalists from spain argentina I, you know I, I know there were uh reporters and photographers from 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 asia as well uh so and and, and briefly i ran into darren neils and and he asked me you know how, you know what are you, what are you thinking like how does it feel like you know we're, we're two days away from the game and the same thing that i just said here i, I told him i said it, it feels like there's a big final on saturday not that there's a big party um it felt there were there was business-like when you spoke to both teams um but looking back i feel like atlanta atlanta united just they were the looser team and and i think that's what we talked about on on the show the week the week prior you know the looser team was going to come out um you know with that trophy and being at training talking to both uh atlanta united players watching them just like scrimmage uh, and, and then speaking to the Portland players, the Portland players were confident, but I just felt like Atlanta United looked really loose and, and really confident going into that final. And to build, you know, you made it when you've got the gear tents, Jarrett, to your point, because when you, when you saw the, the non-licensed yes. gear tents, you know, you've made it in Atlanta to <laughs> sign, um, and, you know, to Felipe's point, like, it was kind of surreal. I mean, even for me, like, um, you know, standing in the puddles of whatever concoction of li- of liquid there was throughout the uh, Lots throughout of the Heineken. Room. Lots of Heineken. Heineken. <laughs> but just, like, standing there and having Stan Sedge call lean over and be like, yeah, Toronto was nuts. You should have been in Toronto last year. That was, that locker room was, that lo- locker room was not safe. But just, like, you know, being able to, you know, talk. And, you know, it's it's awesome getting to talk to all of the guys around Atlanta United and you, Felipe, and, and all the journalists who are always here and see how y'all go about things, with, how y'all process things differently. Mm-hmm. And it was cool seeing that on a, on a national scale with so many national writers coming in as well, hearing their viewpoints and hearing how you know they are kind of getting from point A to point B and maybe taking a different road. Um, one of the pieces you wrote, though, uh, defensively, I cackled the other day because Franco Escobar scored as many goals as Atlanta United allowed in the playoffs. Right. Um, defensively, I mean, this seems like a master class. I mean, was that, was it that to you by Tata? Just everybody locked down and decided we're not going to give up any goals. Yes. You know, I, that's, and that's how I, I described it. Like it was his last tactical master class in major league soccer. And, and what a way to go out. Um, you know, a, a, a manager that will be remembered for, uh, creating the, the, the identity um, and style of play of this club like he entered he arrived and there was a blank canvas and he was given that blank canvas it was part of the deal it was part of the attraction and the appeal of coming to atlanta united and he very much did that they, they were always an attacking team uh, even when he realized uh, before the playoffs that he needed to shore up his defense and and they needed to be stout and in, in order to get through uh, what is traditionally a very difficult uh, playoff run in, in order to win MLS Cup. A lot of great teams or just a lot of good teams um, in MLS you know, don't make it to the final or lose the final. And, and, and I felt like Atlanta United before the playoff run, they were in that group. They, were, they, were, they could possibly be one of those really good teams that fall short uh, because they did have some weaknesses. Uh, and, and it was you know, mainly conceding goals in open play, uh, break, you know, breakdowns in defense, uh, some real garbage goals that they were letting in at the end of the season uh, essentially led them to this this narrative up until kickoff. Can they win the big game 
uh, are they over the Toronto loss? So, so yes, I think it's it, it'll go down in, in in you know this in club history as a, a massive achievement. A, a team that didn't allow a single goal in open play in five games uh, and, and and gets the clean sheet in a final. And and meanwhile, uh, you know this, the the attacking stars are still the heroes. But you know on the back end. Uh, you look at players like uh, LGP and Michael Parkhurst and, and Lorenowitz, and, and and they were the they to me were were the reason why Atlanta United in the end uh, lifted that trophy. Frank Delapa, who's who's been covering soccer in the United States uh, going back to the '70s at the Boston Globe, published his soccer notebook. And something that jumped out to me that I hadn't realized is in the five postseason matches. Michael Parkhurst did not commit one foul. That's wow. incredibly difficult to do for a center back the way Atlanta United plays. He didn't have to. I mean, his positioning was, was so strong and, and the group was so well drilled that it just, he was never put in that situation. The other thing from Frank's column that I think we have to mention, because he's, he's hinted at this on Twitter before, I don't think it had ever actually made it to print. Uh, this is the paragraph, and, and Felipe, I, I want your thoughts after this. Also, Atlanta was fortunate that Martino was available after Orlando City passed on him two years ago. Martino became available soon after his Argentina team lost to Chile on penalty kicks in the 2016 Copa Centenario Final. Three weeks later, Orlando City named Jason Christ to replace Adrian Heath, leaving Martino to pitch himself to Atlanta, which was to begin MLS play in March of 2017. Frank had mentioned that before. I'd seen the tweet before, and people were like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Everybody's going in on this. I know Twelman's chimed in on, on Twitter as well. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's now, you know, where these two clubs are today uh, and, and supposed rivals, right? Um, it, it sounds, it just, it's like a baffling decision by Orlando. Now, I don't have the name in front of me. Like who who is Orlando's president? If I'm not mistaken, he's is he Brazilian or is someone higher up within the organization? I, I'm almost positive is, is Brazilian. They have Brazilian uh, ownership and okay. Alex Letal is the CEO Brazilian. Um I don't know because Orlando's went through a change as Phil Rollins kind of left the club. Um, mm-hmm. After his divorce with his wife Kay, Kay is still involved on the foundation side. Phil kind of left it. I think Phil was more hands on and involved at the beginning, and I don't know at that stage where that was. Um, I don't know who was making those decisions at that point. Well, my point is, and I don't have anything to back this up. This is purely my personal opinion. Let's put that out there. But I always felt that you know, even with that, you know, the, the back, the back, the front office having kind of some, some Brazilian roots, Orlando being a very, uh, there's a strong Brazilian community in Orlando. Uh, there was this the kind of, I, I felt like Orlando could take advantage of that and maybe bring in some players. Obviously they had Kaká and they could have that sort of identity and, and connection with, with that, with that community in, in Orlando. So, Maybe they just didn't want an Argentine coach. Maybe they felt, of all coaches, why would we hire an Argentine? We're Brazilians, and and that's not going to rub well with, with some of our fans. And who knows? Maybe it, 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 soccer is very petty. You know, was, oh, at, yeah. at that level, it's extremely petty. And we don't know that that was the case. It was just something that culturally and ideologically they just could not do. So, but looking back, I mean, it's hard to believe that you would leave. Uh, you would close the door on Tata Martino when he was in hockey. Yeah, it's pretty shocking. Uh, Felipe, we could keep you all morning. There will be more stuff uh-huh. that will pop up. We'll be talking to you uh, plenty during the off season. But we can finish with this. Uh, Santos FC just tweeted out that Santos and Jorge Sampaoli have a signed acceptance on the proposal. Uh, final details and signing of the contract will be finalized in face-to-face meetings this weekend. But Santos is saying that San Paolo is going to be their guy. There you go, and and it's a big, a, a big opportunity and 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 a pressure filled opportunity for Jorge Sampaoli. Don't think mm-hmm. he's going from Argentina, the national team, to a cushy job. He's going to be expected to win and nothing else at Santos internationally, locally, you know, obviously domestically. Uh, so yeah, big, big, big opportunity for him. 
Yeah, huge one for him. Uh, make sure you're following Felipe Carr on Twitter. All of Felipe's great work is over at The Athletic. Thanks for taking the time for us, and we'll catch up next week. All right, guys. Take care. Be Take good. care. Final break right now. We'll be back to finish up the show after this. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative, and that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking you questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Final segment, soccer down here. We've, we've thrown timing sheets just out the window this week because, <laughs> I mean, it's the off season and things happen. So, yeah, there you go. Yes. Uh, let's catch up on a couple bits of stuff that are out there that we have not touched on or things we have talked about but not gone into detail on. Probably the biggest one is Dallas and Orlando and whatever in the world is going on with the front office in both places. Jordan yeah. Culver... Our friend of the show has reported that Luis Mozzi is making the decisions in Orlando. He has not been announced as the new general manager yet. Uh, Dallas is saying not so fast. Uh, he is here and he is working on our behalf. So <laughs> I don't know mm-hmm. what's going on with that. Um, the other rumors that are really interesting, and I believe Sam Stashkal has has dug into this on MLSsoccer.com, Looks like Dallas is going to go very young going forward. Uh, Luchi Gonzalez is the front runner to be named as the new manager. You have this academy that is producing players. Luchi was the former academy director. He knows this talent firsthand. It looks like you're going to see Paxton Pomacall and Reggie Cannon, who we did see. But a lot of these players who have not had these opportunities are going to get this time with Dallas, and they will be a true selling club now. That's a little different. Oscar Pereja won a Supporter Shield in 2016, which is not that long ago. Uh, won an Open Cup in 2016. Would have been the odds-on favorite for MLS Cup that year, if not for Mauro Diaz's Achilles injury. It will be. It'll take some getting used to for Dallas, because anytime you're going to truly play the kids and, and commit to that, you're going to take your lumps. And I wonder what a fan base that has honestly had – issues turning out in big numbers for a good product what right. it's going to be like for this product uh, i i'm gonna look at that stadium and i just don't think there's going to be a whole lot of people in it and it's a shame because dallas is a tremendous the metroplex is a tremendous soccer following metroplexian kind of place and knowing that you're going young it's going to take a lot of patience from the fan base i just don't know how many of them are going to go there and spend discretional dollars on something where they know that the results may not be there in 2019 yeah i really hope that 
they're able to find a way to connect this young local talent base to the yeah. fans' emotional heartstrings. I, I hope they find a way to do it because I'd hate to see Dallas go in this direction that is a very bold direction to take. I, I like it. It fits for them with their academy. Yeah. But it's risky. It's risky mm-hmm. on the fan side. It's risky on the um, just on, on the, what it's going to look like perception-wise. Because you will see a drop off. I don't think you're going to be able to expect this to be as strong of a club in the Western Conference going forward. A couple other bits of news around the league. Uh, Ike Parra is reportedly asking for a raise in 2019. He's open to trade offers too. Kansas City saying, We're not trading you. This is all from ESPN's Jeff Carlisle. Portland is going to allow Samuel Armenteros to leave. They allowed his loan to expire, so it's going to be Jeremy Abobasi or somebody new starting up top. And I wonder if Portland has any regrets about the Fernando Adi deal and turning it over to Armenteros and then that not working out. Now, I don't know if the grand plan was Abobasi or, or not, but a little risky to go into 2019 at this stage without a top striker. Maybe a bogus he can turn into that. I'm not sure. Yeah, and you know, Armentero started out like that proverbial house of fire that we talk about, and then was just injuries, and then getting bumped out of 11s, and that hot start just kind of fizzled away for the remainder of the year, and he was a non-factor going into the postseason. So, you know, does a bogus get the keys up top? That's what I want to see. Toronto moved up in the allocation order. They acquired the number two spot from San Jose. Generally, that type of thing happens when a move is is coming. And remember, the allocation order, it's a a small list of players that are in that process to acquire. Uh, I'm not sure who has the number one spot at the moment. I'm assuming Cincinnati. I don't think they've used it or moved it at this point. So then Toronto would be number two. So if a, a player on that list returns to the league Cincinnati would have the first option to get them if they pass then it'd go to Toronto so stay tuned sounds like Toronto's up to something the Red Bulls did re-sign Tim Parker there were questions on if that was going to happen they made a big deal to get him from Vancouver he paired up with Aaron Long uh, probably best center back pairing in the league this year Parker's on a three-year deal and Ron Waxman uh, who I believe is Parker's agent tweeted out that it's a three-year deal for 2.4 million plus in total uh, it's about 800000 He's going to be one of the highest-paid defenders in the league. That comes with expectations. So yes. we will see if he can continue to raise his level. Um, I, I've been so impressed with Aaron Long. I, I, I wonder if Long might be the better of the two. And they're both really good. But Aaron yep. Long, it's oof. Uh, both of them, mm-hmm. that's, that's a good fit. And that's a good pairing. And you want to keep that together as long as possible. Like Cincinnati. That trying to get Fabian Johnson. They tried last summer. It looks like they're still trying to get him. There's a lot of talk about it on all your different soccer media outlets. Uh, I'll be curious to see if they can pull that off in January or if maybe they have to wait till the summer. But it's, it seems like it's going to happen where all the conversation is. It's just a matter of timing and when they're going to be able to do it. Another player like Aiko Parra who wants a raise, and this is from Pablo Maurer, uh, MLSist on Twitter, Luciano Acosta. He's tweeted some interesting things. A uh, picture of him waving at the fans and saying something like goodbye, and people freaked mm-hmm. out. Then he posted some pictures during his time at Boca Juniors and talked about how happy he was. Uh, reportedly, there's interest in him both domestically and abroad. I, I don't think he's going to have a problem finding a club if he doesn't get the raise that he wants. I wonder if DC would be willing to sell if they decide not to give him that raise. Look out at Luciano Acosta. And I think you're going to see this more and more often. Players who are understanding where their value is in this league and wanting to be paid to the full amount as the league continues to grow and as you see 70,000 crowds and all those types of things. Yes. You're going to want more money. And that's a good thing for the league. And we'll see how these owners and these general managers handle the new world of MLS. ESPN has made a big move, and I love it. Um, yep. John Champion coming to the United States to be the primary play-by-play voice for ESPN. And, and Adrian Healy has been really good, and Healy and Twelman have great chemistry, and they've been really good. But John Champion's one of my favorite play-by-play voices, period, in the world. Like, 
he is one of my all time favorites. Uh, if you go back to the Atlanta United branding video when the name and logo was announced, that was John Champion voicing that. Uh, that was kind of cool. So he will be your primary Major League Soccer voice on ESPN, and just I think their primary American soccer voice as a whole. You will still hear Adrian Healy. You will still hear Ian Dark. You will still hear a lot of the traditional voices you're used to, but Champion will be the main guy, and he'll be paired with Twelman. So I love it. And as someone who you know spends his weekends hip deep in the Premier League, hearing John Champion there, uh, just I, I love Champion. I love his delivery. I love what he brings to the game on a game by game basis, and the passion that's there. And and uh, I'm looking forward to having him as the the primary voice next year. It's a really cool thing. Nashville is making a bold move, it appears. Uh, Jeff Reuter of the Athletics reporting that they are close to bringing in Cameron Lancaster from Louisville, who announced that he would be leaving Louisville City. Wow. They already brought in Daniel Rios, and he's on an MLS yeah. deal. Uh, now if you get Lancaster, you're talking about the two top goal scorers in USL last season. How do they fit together is, is a question I have. Um, how this is going to look, I, I'm thinking maybe we see Gary Smith return to the three five two that yep. we saw him use here in Atlanta with the Silverbacks and, and have a good season with them while he had healthy pieces to work with. So keep an eye on that. And Lancaster's a guy that if he performs well, he could be in line for an MLS deal going forward. He's at that kind of level, I think. Um, so this might be like a year-long audition in some ways for him in Nashville. On the women's side, a couple bits. Uh, the World Cup draw was this past weekend, and with all of the craziness here in Atlanta with MLS Cup, we haven't had a chance to dig into it. United States is in a group with Sweden, who it seems like the United States plays in every single women's competition, every single time. It's U.S. and Sweden. Uh, Chile and Thailand. It's a, it's a comfortable group. The, the U.S. should get through that with, with little problems. Uh, Thailand is not a powerhouse in the game yet. Chile is improving, but that's one that the U.S. should be able to handle with, with little trouble. And then Sweden is a test, and Sweden is who knocked the U.S. out of the last Olympics. So be a little bit on the line there. But good draw for the U.S., and we'll, we'll continue to cover all of this. Something that is on my list of my wish list for 2019 is a weekly women's soccer show here on the SDH Network. Um, we got to figure out how to do it, who can do it, how we put it together. But yeah, that is something in a world cup year that needs to happen. And yep. we're going to figure it out one way or another to make it happen. So stay tuned. Uh, something we'd like to launch in January. And one other bit on, on the NWSL side, Barcelona, who's been mentioned to a expansion club in Los Angeles for quite a while. Might not happen in, in California. They want to keep the Barca branding, and I think that's been the sticking point with groups they've talked to in California, and LAFC was more than likely one of those. They are being linked now to possibly go into Miami and partnering with Inter Miami, which would be quite intriguing. So stay tuned. It looks like Barca will do a team. We just don't know when and what it's going to look like and where it's going to be, but... We've watched Spain as a whole invest heavily in the women's game, and Barcelona has wanted to do that, and part of that is going to be launching a club in the United States on the women's side. I think it's a savvy move. I just want to see how it all comes together and how it comes off. So stay tuned. I'm intrigued. Uh, I'm very intrigued to see if Barcelona partners with David Beckham, Real Madrid Ooh. superstar, in Miami on a women's team. There's questions. A plus B plus C, yes. I mean, there's questions. I mean, the, the Real Madrid-Barcelona part's not a big deal. David Beckham's a, a big boy. He's going to be able to handle all that just fine. But um, does women's soccer work in Miami? I, I want to see it. And I think it's a, a very smart thing for Inter Miami to consider. They're also talking about some, some pretty big names with their academy that they're looking to launch. Uh, one of them that, that you guys would know is Javier Morales, former Real Salt Lake legend who joined Dallas's academy late in the year, and I'm wondering if he joined it because of Luchi Gonzalez and or, and or Oscar Pereja. He finished his career in Dallas, but he's being linked to going to Miami to be a big part of their academy launch. And 
Javier Morales is one of the all-time greats in Major League Soccer, so would love to see him involved in teaching the next generation. That'd be very cool. Anything else on the timeline, John, we need to hit before we uh, wrap up? Well, let's see. Uh, there's the Shaq Moore news on oh, our yeah. timeline. but I'm- Yeah, the Shaq Moore thing, while you check the Twitter timeline real quick, the club he's with, second division in Spain, there are reports that they are on the brink of going bankrupt. Um, they This might be their last game that they can pay people. <laughs> so Shaq Moore is an Atlanta native, Powder Springs, uh, right back who has gotten time with the national team. You know, if he needs somewhere to play, uh, we know a place. It, it'd be interesting. Yes. Uh, although we have it. a lot of options on the right side. I don't know what that looks like, but anyway. Uh, Shaq Moore is a guy to keep an eye on if his club goes under and what what could be next for him he he took a bold move going to spain in the first place and he's had a tough road but he's still gotten to the national team on this tough road he's been on i want to see where he could end up if this is the case and i'd assume for sure in the summer he's going to move on and, and end up somewhere new and on the twitter timelines i want to start off with the uh, josh eisenberg picture that he sent us where you know you're kind of missing everything going on with Atlanta United, and then there's a sign that you get from above that uh, makes you kind of just have a little wink. So he was going through a, a it looked like an apartment or a condo subdivision. Mm-hmm. Guess what the speed limit sign was? Yeah, why is there a 17 speed limit sign in a complex? That's bizarre. That's a I've weird never number heard to of, hit. It is quite. No, I, I completely and totally agree. That's cool. I like it, except that'd be really hard to drive 17 miles an hour. Yes. Oh, and do you want to get into uh, Chewy's question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Chewy. Um, Or championship trains, whatever you would like to be referred to these days. Uh, John, thoughts on um, Atlanta United Monday night? Hey, Stanley Cup has been thrown off of bridges. It's been submerged in pools. thrown off of bridges? Yeah. Why would you do that? Just, uh, just to see if it floated. Okay. That's a new level of and drunk. They had, to, they had to pull it out of a, I think they had to pull it out of a river once because it was tossed off a bridge, and then they had to go find it. I mean, this is like in the early days of when teams got to hang on to it and things like that. But, right. no, if, if you have the hardware, you get to do with it whatever you want. And if you decide that uh, you, want to, you want to purchase, say uh, – a piece of entertainment for said cup so it can enjoy its experience in Atlanta. More power to you. <laughs> I don't think it's an experience that it had ever had in its lifetime. <laughs> and I think that this year, now do this, do they get to keep it for the entire year? Do we get the stand? Does it, do we get the Stanley cup treatment with it where everybody gets it for a day? I don't know if everybody gets it for a day. Um, I believe that the club keeps the trophy for the year. And then as you get close to MLS Cup in 2019, they return it to the league. And I think they get to keep a replica for good. I was going to say, I, was gonna say, I hope that you would get uh, a something resembling yeah. the one that you got to hoist yeah, and get your yeah, fingerprints yeah. all over. Yeah. Which I, I think it's been cleaned very well as it's made the rounds since Monday night. Oh, no doubt. To say and no, but seriously, I mean, anything that the cup gets to experience in its time in Atlanta or with the roster or with anybody who gets to hang on to it for a little while, nothing will surprise me. And uh, I think that you'll have a lot of unique celebrations with it. And I think that the social media attached to said uniqueness will truly make it uh, an Atlanta United MLS Cup based experience. Trust me, there will be some things done with that piece of shiny hardware that have never been done before. And I think the uh, the nighttime tour with, for uh, entertainment purposes only was only the first step. Yeah, that was that was good stuff. That was a lot of fun. Oh, I, um, I haven't even gotten to ask you about what it was like to be in the parade. Oh, jeez, man i i was I was all nervous getting ready for MLS Cup and everything Saturday, but I was so busy Friday with with media and and just getting ready that I didn't really have time to to think about it which was good because I probably would have been a complete wreck um I mean Friday I did 
our two hour show, I did an eleven thirty interview with Brad Friedel, who was awesome, by the way. Uh really thoughtful interview. That's up on the the ninety two nine the game uh off the woodwork folder and up on the website. Go check that out. I mean we we talked about MLS Cup, but we talked about just soccer as a whole and and you know, Brad was awesome. It was a great conversation. Talk to Maurice Adu at twelve thirty. And show was nine to eleven, eleven thirty interview, twelve thirty interview with Marisa Du on the phone. He was great. I thought his work on Fox was great. He's one of my new favorite uh, analysts and commentators. Uh, really like his perspective. One thirty did an interview with our friends up at Sirius XM Canada. That was cool. Um, then two thirty talked to our friends at ESPN Coastal. Talked to Ben Troop and BJ Bennett, um, giving them the lay of the land. <laughs> Kevin, yeah. Uh, Kevin was yep. not there on this conversation. He might have laid oh. out because it was the soccer conversation. I don't know, but I talked to BJ well, they, yeah, cause, and True. Because they did a separate one with me, and they actually got into soccer a little bit because of the crossover with the high school football yeah. championship. So, yeah, they hit us both up. Yeah, so that was Friday. That that was up till 2.30. Then went to State of the League, talked to lots of folks there, caught up with the, the soccer cooligans, watched them uh, have a great conversation with Don Garber, which was quite entertaining. Um, Don's pretty cool. Don Don's a pretty cool dude. Um, he gets then it. was on with Dukes and Bell, and then sat in with Andy Bunker for an hour. So Friday was completely booked. Like by the time I got home, I was so tired I didn't have you know energy to be nervous. Then Saturday, everything leading up to you know getting into the stadium, I was busy. You know, I was going over my notes in the morning getting everything ready we do our tailgate show we cross over with jay and kelly from unrelegated that was a blast seeing so many people and then trying to just get into the bins because it's nasty and pouring down rain and ugh. um yeah get in there sit down and then time completely slows down while we are waiting and waiting and waiting for everything luckily we had a two-hour pregame show because then you're you're back in work mode and you're thinking but um all of that, so the game, I'm just trying to be professional, trying to do the job, trying to, to you know, be me, but also not be out of control me and be excited and jumping up and down and going nuts. So kept it together. It was a lot of fun. Um, was there late, finally crashed. You know, Sunday was just lots of odds and ends and, and trying to sleep. And then Sunday night I couldn't sleep because I was excited about being in a freaking parade. Um, I woke up at four thirty in the morning, Monday morning, wow. because I just couldn't sleep anymore because I was excited about being in a parade. <laughs> um, the thing that I will always remember about all of this was how many people. First off, just people running into the parade route and joining into the march and turning a parade. Exactly, into a march. that was cool. But how many people like sought Mike and I out and Jimmy and Minna and just said thank you and just said they they listen they they love the coverage and just saying thank you that blew my mind like that that it was that big of a deal it was really cool um and i mean we were commentating on a on a parade from the back seat of a car jimmy didn't run anybody over which was uh great because that was difficult not to saw the pictures yeah um and we're we're doing the parade from the back of the car. Then we get to the Home Depot backyard. We're on with Rick and John for a long time. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then stoppage time on Tuesday. Like, I kind of looked at it after, because I said I didn't want to know what was going to happen after kickoff. I, d- I knew a parade was being planned because we all did. But I didn't want any details. I didn't want to know anything. So Mike gets no. to tell me on the postgame show that we're going to be in the parade, which is pretty cool. Um, Saw that. Then I knew, okay, we had the parade. I knew we had all of that. And I knew we had stoppage time live. That was kind of the end of the season for me. That's the way it worked in my mind. So, again, it was a blast because it was packed. Uh, I was going to say, what was it like for stoppage time live when Gressel showed up? Just Julian making the time to do it Um, and being such a great interview and being so open. Um, Just an awesome representation of, of what this team is all about. And then hanging out, taking pictures with folks. I mean, 
You know, this is a guy who's getting married in a month. This is a guy who just had the biggest, you know, accomplishment of his professional career. And to take that time for us and for the fans was was super cool. And then just how many people had questions and, and just wanted to talk afterwards and take pictures. It was it was the perfect cap to everything. So yeah, like now it's finally hitting me like, okay, catch your breath really quickly. Mm-hmm. Because uh, there's lots of things to talk about because of managers and players and and trades and all kinds of stuff. And then before you know it, CONCACAF Champions League is right around the corner. So, you know, you, you want to you know, you take that time and enjoy it and reflect on it. And it seems like different things make me reflect on it. Jay Riddle made me cry with his video. Um, that was awesome. I did not even remember saying some of that stuff because I was having an out of body experience. I, I, okay, full disclosure, I'm going to break the fourth wall here. We already broke it a long when, time. Yeah. Uh, I was there for the last 10 minutes of regulation. And I told, I told Jarrett, I said, I'm going to the booth. And on my phone, and, and Jimmy asked me to, to tape, on my phone, I have the end of full time with Mike and the two of you, and then your statement with Atlanta as Familia and all of that. I, I have that plus a couple of minutes, so it's about a five-minute file on my phone. So to hear the two of you get to bring the broadcast home, to see Mike get as excited as he did, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with tears because it's, you know, hey, first time and you're calling a championship that hasn't happened in 23 years. And as integral a part as the two of you have been in calling matches home and away, which isn't something that's done for a lot of franchises in MLS. And for you to be there to uh, quote Kevin Egan as the Godfather and bring the story back full circle after 50 years and give that historical context to it. For me, it was a treat to sit there and see as a, as a, as an announcer to see how you guys bring it home and put that, put that bow on there and I've got it and I'm not getting rid of it. And I've tried to upload it to my Google file and it has not behaved every single time. So I have a five and a half minute video that is sitting on my phone right now that Jimmy has. So, I could not be more proud as a, as a, as an announcer of the both of you for how you put a bow on things and how you told the story and getting to be front and center storytellers for this entire run to this point. It's been really cool for me to see as a, a pseudo detached part of the whole thing, but at the same time to see it from an announcer's perspective who has been through a lot of Jason, what you and I talk about with all the other leagues and all the other teams and all the hardships and all the ups and downs and to bring it to that point and bring it home. I just thought it was a, a really great moment for radio. I, I hope it, it came off well because I, there was nothing prepared. There was nothing, you know, thought and that's out. The worst, and that's the worst thing too. If you have something prepared and you're reading because people can tell. Yeah, no, I just can't operate that way. So I, I hope we captured it. Um, it, I definitely felt a lot of responsibility in that because yeah. I don't think the 68 Chiefs game was, was carried locally. I know there was a national broadcast on CBS, but it was it was for the national audience. I don't think there was a local radio call or anything. And um, I don't know who called the Knights win, but it, it, that is minor league. It is a little different. Um, I mean... You know, I've always Ken double. At, I'm not sure. I don't know what their radio was at that point or how it looked, but that's in a different category. Um, not to diminish it, it just is because of minor yeah. league and top flight and all that. Um, yeah. I've always looked at the the work because I grew up on it. That Skip Carey and Pete Van Weer and and Ernie Johnson and the Braves crew did. Um, they were the voice of my childhood, whether they were on TV or radio. And yeah. you know, I thought a lot about skip's call of the 95 world series and and that so i hope that we did those guys proud i I hope that 
you know, people who have grown up in Atlanta got it because, I mean, we we tried to give you all season the true Atlanta call. And some people don't like that. Some people want, you know, a, a neutral call even on local radio. I disagree, and I especially disagree in this market and – and what I what I know local radio sports to be, um, I grew up on Skip Carey and Larry Munson. <laughs> and yeah, I'm not gonna, here in the southeast. I'm it not is different hide from that. It is. I think it truly is. And I think you know we want to capture that and and do it the way that we feel it should be. And all of the positive uh, feedback and. And stuff from people, like, throughout the week. I mean, it started Saturday night, soon after the final whistle, all the way. I mean, I'm still getting messages and comments and and stuff from people that it's just blown me away. So, yeah, like, it's it's hit me at different points at different times, like, not all at once. And I'm probably glad that it hasn't because I'd be in a puddle of tears on the floor in the fetal position. And I haven't been, no, no, I don't want to do that because then I'll, I'll be incapacitated for a while. This has been good. It's been little things. Off the air, off the air, you can do whatever you want, my friend. No, no, I have lots of things to do. I'm a busy man. So (laughs) I'm trying to, to keep going, but now it's, it's hit me and I, I know how it feels and I've been able to process how it feels and hopefully I've been able to share that, like how it truly felt to me and you know, just thanks everybody who listens because don't get to do that if y'all aren't out there listening. And we know the ratings are showing that people are listening and we see the ratings for SDH and we know that people are listening and we know that people tweet at us and share that with us. So thank you because none of it matters without y'all. That's, I mean, that's just the straight up facts about it. So uh, we should probably stop at some point because it's it's been total CONCACAF stoppage time type of show. We've got a show tomorrow. We'll have more to talk about. Um, yeah, because I still have to get caught up on some things. Yeah, yeah. These off-season shows will be kind of like this where there's just lots of things to dig into and stretch out on, and, and we will do that uh, when we have the opportunity. There's lots of things that Atlanta United's working on to get to 2019 in a big way because it's a big year. It's the life of a big club. You know, it doesn't stop. It doesn't fade away. You're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to, you know, stop moving forward. And I don't expect Atlanta to ever do that. So buckle up, keep enjoying it, and get ready for uh, 2019 because it's, what, (laughs) three weeks away? (laughs) I mean, Yeah, really? So basically you're telling me to get my passport. Well, yeah, I mean, if you can get to Costa Rica, uh, that's going to be a special thing for the people that can get there. And it's a small venue, and it's not going to be easy to get in, and it's going to be very, very different and very exciting and very intense, and I cannot wait. Um, I can't wait for all of it. So thanks, everybody. We're going to stop talking now, and we'll be back to talk more tomorrow at 9 a.m. on the app on SoccerDownHere.net on... Spreaker and on ESPN Coastal in the late night, not at 9 a.m., but you can check it out when you want to. XL Sports Network, Barn Burner, everybody, thank you so much. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata, y'all.